more people than any other state in the country. This is where we saw it happen. And when we look at the data, which has been released by the state, 90% of the arrests were men, more than 50% were Black, and more than 35% were Hispanic. And so what we're struggling with right now is um, what the government has to do to be accountable for past poor policies that cause communities to be disproportionately impacted in the way that um, enforcement was uh, actually rolled out. And our state is the first to say that the government has to fix it because it was a problem created by government. So I'm thrilled to do that work. Ooh, yes, <laughs> I'm going to do the work. It's more than just about smoking and doing um, since you are our business students and at least thinking about it from that mindset, let me show you the framework that we're working with today. And in the next two years, we'll probably have this 5E framework. Number one and number two, our foundation is equity and education. I've been saying that because we all need to be talking about it in the same way. When we talk about equity, you're hearing a lot of different things, social equity, racial equity, economic, environmental. We are really uh, subscribing to the 10 pillars of health equity, which represents social, economic, environmental, and human. It's the most expansive thought on it. And the reality is that we know that while this has been a tool for um, systemic racism, it's been a tool for inequities for so many decades, we can actually make it a tool into the equity that we want for all communities. The other piece is education, which is why I'm here. It's much more than what we know um, that media may be feeding us about a joint or what's Zaza or what's not, like what's high and what's not. It truly is an agricultural, industrial, spiritual, medicinal, um, nutritional plant. There's so many uses. And we really only understand 30% of the plant. And yet with just that 30%, we know that there are over 50,000 uses and we haven't even tapped the beginning of it. And so that's important for us to deliver that education. My pillars are pretty obvious, but I want to call out entrepreneurship and economic development as a primary. We are here to create new entrepreneurs in the space and I want to make sure you have all the tools to do so. But also there's workforce development as well as community repair and res restoration that can happen from this new industry. And so all of my work is uh, really creating a framework to put it all together. And that is a pretty big framework. So the snapshot is we can't become a global hub unless we're a hub here. And a large part of my job is to be working with all of the agencies in the city to develop a inner agency hub of citywide resources and services, specific, specifically for New Yorkers that want to participate in this thriving and sustainable industry. So our snapshot is pretty big and I always show it because I want people to understand just how big. I have a team of three with me, but we work across 120 or more leaders in the city and we are the hub. And this is a wheel that has a lot of spokes that cannabis interacts with. Where it seems most obvious in the Department of Small Business Services absolutely would be how do we get licensed businesses in? How do we get ancillary businesses in? The workforce development piece, so this upper uh, right quadrant, this career exploration. But where I also have to do a lot of work is on the enforcement side. How do we make sure we have a full supply chain here? We have to work with DOB on land use and permitting and ensuring that even though we live on top of each other, we, do, we can actually cultivate here. Urban agriculture is a priority for the administration, is it not? And cannabis is agricultural. And so there's an opportunity for us in a lot of different places. And I'm looking forward to working with BMCC and um, so many other institutions on how do we build out higher education and research and development. Um, I skipped a slide, sorry. So how did we work on the back end? I, I figured I would tell y'all because I'm building a team. And so if there's interest, is always a good thing to show you how we're hired. Um, again, I have over 120 leaders. There are a lot of different agencies that will impact cannabis. DOHMH, I said the Administration for Children's Services gave us these lock boxes. We work with the uh, Department of Buildings. So having a cannabis specialty is going to impact a lot of different areas. In my world right now, I'm recruiting for two roles. Um, I need a senior policy and research analyst. And I'm also looking for a strategy and outreach um, associate, someone who can help me as we go to the various neighborhoods to ensure we're actually creating culturally competent outreach materials and marketing that we have an office to support people. 
I also have a lot of interns. So Chizu, will you raise your hand? He's our first intern. And you're at CCNY? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we, we will work very diligently with schools to make sure that if you want to learn about what we're doing, you can also intern at our office as well. I'm pretty much looking for interns always at this point for credit as well as for um, pay. Uh, we're building a trifecta coalition. I used to play ball, so I use a lot of basketball references. Um, and so this is the first of probably five at least. But um, the goal is for you to understand that in other markets where cannabis legalized, community was never at the center of it. Um, even if business was leading the charge or government was leading the charge, it was rare to see community. Here is a mandate as part of the law that passed that we have a community-centered approach, and particularly looking at communities that have been disproportionately impacted. But in general, that's the heart. And the businesses are all small businesses, really, that we think of. But we love any big business that's aligned in the mission to also come and support. And lastly, government protected. When you have this community-centered approach, oftentimes a big lobbying firm can come in and they can wipe away the center of being the community. The government has to hold the line. That's what my office is doing to make sure that we're listening and learning from everyone that is involved, but in particular the external stakeholders. So we've been doing a lot of public education and engagement. That is really my, my thing at this point. I'm doing a lot of other things behind the scenes, but if you see me, somebody jokingly said I'm the Beyonce of cannabis, I'll take it because I'm on tour. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yes, I've done in the last six months more than 50 events that I've attended. I will come and speak. Um, if it works out that I already have a connection, even better. We've done a lot of community training. We'll continue to do more. We just we just took over the parade and rally. And if you were able to get out to Union Square Park, multiple thousands of people joined us there. Some of the swag is from that. Um, and we will continue. This liftoff cannabis NYC tour is going to go to every borough multiple times. I have more than 40 days planned across five boroughs. That's the emoji, the Sheeta in my rocket. Um, and you're welcome to join me in the rocket. Upcoming next, we have our big business to business conference. And I do have a free promo code for you as well because I want as many people to go to be, to be part of this. It's June 1st through the 3rd at Jacob Javits. We'll be at the Cannabis World Congress and Business Expo. We'll have a launch pad there. So come by, say hi. I also kick off with a keynote that's free to everyone as well. But it's just important for you to recognize that our goal right now is to be where the community is. And that's business community as well as the consumers, as well as uh, educators, uh, the religious community, clergy, everywhere that we need to learn about cannabis. As we move into Q3, I'll also be doing more demand driven. So if you want another event to come to your campus, then we will bring it here. Um, I know you have a question in the back, we'll have a QA in a second. Um, and we'll eventually be hosting a Spanish only one by uh, popular demand as well. So we'll keep everybody posted on that. Um, our big uh, launch this quarter is our hub. This is a sign up. I'll also make sure that I get it to Professor Shane. But basically, if you want to make sure you're in the know, you got to be part of our hub. Um, I think, and if we haven't fully decided, I think the name is going to be called The Plug because it is oh, yeah. plugging people in. But um, I, I think at the end of the day, the goal is really internal to the city got a lot going on, external to the city has a lot going on. And again, we're that one place where we get to roll it up. And um, one of our interns will be working on this project as well. So I think it's, again, I'm not building anything by myself, but it is uh, important to know there. Um, the more engaged you are, the more likely you can also become an ambassador. An ambassador is digital or in person. At the end of the day, it's great to hear from me, but if people hear from their friends and their people that they trust that are influencers already, even better. And so we're looking for digital and in-person ambassadors to kick us off in quarter three. And the way that's gonna work basically is one, start coming up out to things, but two, um, we'll have an ongoing RFP that basically if you can come up with what your budget and your plan is for up to 20K, could probably help plan an event as well. Um, so we're wanting to get the community involved as much as possible. Uh, this summer, we have a career exploration experience that we're also launching. So if you're 18 to 25, 
Um, in particular, we're looking at justice involved, but that doesn't mean you have to be. Uh, we're looking in the time frame of July and August. It's going to be a two week uh, uh, experience, being a mixture of going to the farms to visit, manufacturing facilities. We now have a licensed facility in Queens, um, being able to understand how you make gummies, how you're making tinctures, how you're making pre rolls. Um, and also workshops to let people understand what it's like to work in the industry. I think a lot of people immediately think, okay, maybe I'll be a bud tender, which by the way, is nothing more than a retail associate. The product is cannabis, but you work, you're running the retail. So in some ways we are changing the language of it, but there's more interesting science and technology behind the supply chain in total. Um, and so there's so many places to plug in um, business knowledge. And so, yeah, uh, we're working very quickly to get that up, and I'll make sure I pass that link for registration for people. That is also meant to be a paid experience, by the way. Last but not least, if you are interested in actually starting a business, we're in the right place. SPS is where all New Yorkers can start or grow their business. Uh, Cannabis NYC has been curating uh, basically what SPS already has and infusing cannabis in it in an appropriate way. Um, we'll be introducing a workshop series that helps people basically get a certificate to say, hey, we did that intro 12 hours. Um, and it allows you to, I think, look a little bit different to the state when you come with a license application. We're also helping people navigate the other city agencies. So you're going to have to get a permit no matter what. But if we have the Department of Buildings and understanding already, we're trying to push this through, we're going to make sure that um, things move a lot faster than normal. Uh, the community board is also a scary place when you're a young entrepreneur. Um, they don't always look like you in age and demographic, and we help people navigate through that as well. And lastly, the capital. I've been talking about this now a little bit more. Oh, I forgot we got a lot more. These are just some of the things that are coming your way to make sure that people can start businesses. This will all launch in the fall, so I will make sure I have links for you all. But uh, you can't do anything without money. And so the Cannabis NYC loan fund is something I've been working on for the better part of the last seven months and we hope to launch it by the end of this year. And it's really, again, ensuring that we have that uh, financing that is necessary for people to actually get into the industry. Um, and we'll be providing technical assistance uh, to make sure that people are able to you know, stay compliant. Um, it looks like I have an old ride on the table here, but this was just so y'all know, we are an advisory board member. We're engaging with all of the schools, and I'm glad to see Floyd here uh, to talk about the MCC Lehman's um, efforts, but there's a lot going on in our city. Considering we just legalized two years ago, we're already ahead of Colorado as far as local education, so mm -hmm. you're in the right place. And then everybody always asks me about the illegal smoke shops, and I think it's always good to kind of end with that because, one, it happens in every market, so it is not abnormal. What is abnormal is only in New York City can you walk across the Brooklyn Bridge and go past 100 street vendors that also are not licensed. This is the place of opportunity, and so we have the combination of a lag period plus opportunists who don't really care about what we're trying to do necessarily um, that are popping out, and we're working really quickly to try to pinpoint who's actually causing the most trauma to us as the people who have worked to legalize. It's not a demonstration of excellence more often than not. If I'm being real, it's not good weed either. So it is a combination of poor products, poor pricing uh, strategy, and not going back into the community disproportionately impacted. So we're encouraging everyone, communities in particular, to really stand up and stand out against the proliferation of stores, especially when they're not owned by people from those communities. My job is less on the direct enforcement side. I make sure the sheriff is doing it with equity and education. I make sure that we're not doing the war on drugs 2.0 and we're not re-traumatizing communities, but I primarily focus on the facilitation and the rehabilitation side. And the reason you see it in this pyramid is because for all the media conversation on the enforcement, there's a lot less that we'll do of that as long as we're building a way for people to facilitate getting into the industry. Um, and that means the plug becoming legit. I do think it's a, a puzzle. And I've been saying make the plug legit since about 2018. And it's a, it's a real simple puzzle. If the plug is connected to hundreds or thousands of people that they are providing cannabis to, and that one plug, that one person goes legit, everybody, theoretically, if you like your plug, you're going to go legit with your plug as well. And I think that that's an 
a, a, a campaign we have yet to really start in New York. Right now, we're still very like um, unsure how you actually cross over, but we're creating those mechanisms right now to make it easy. And then if you've already been doing this, and maybe you got a cease and desist, the good news is it's not all over. You can actually be rehabilitated. And honestly, that means coming up with other business models for you to be successful in the interim until you get licensed. For most people, that's actually the hemp time. Right now, you can get a hemp license for retail for $300. You're not waiting for a whole industry to be built. Hemp is analogous to uh, marijuana. It's all part of the same genus. And it's a big business mistake to look it over because you're leaving money on the table. It's already federally legal. And there's a lot of actual grants coming out of the federal landscape around hemp derived products as well. So I, I kind of am always pushing what's the alternative. All right, so what's happening in New York? Uh, a lot and then not enough, right, at the same time. I know y'all already know that we don't have enough legal dispensaries open, uh, but the medical program is improved. That's why I left. I left in 2016. I had early MS and I needed to be part of the medical program so I could be a consumer with dignity and not be looking over my shoulder all the time as I was hitting up the club on a regular basis, but I could not qualify for New York's medical program. So I had to go as a patient refugee. Now I'm back and the program is actually way better than it ever could be. It's free. The state has removed the cost and you're only paying for maybe the cost of your doctor. If you are part of the medical program, you can legally grow at home. That's an important aspect of the program. And in the meantime, we have six adult use dispensaries open, um, a lot of licenses across the traditional pizza sale. Um, and in New York, we have now 103 stores that could be open, even though it's only six in New York City. Um, we just got a release of new regulations. There are about 350 pages of a lot of legal jargon. And a part of my job is to make sure people can walk through it. So we'll be having some regulatory reviews just on that alone. Right now, the seven license types that they're looking at that will represent the larger part of the industry is the nursery, cultivator, processor, distributor, retail, cooperative, and micro business. They are looking at retail with on-site consumption as part of this package, but we don't have only delivery or only on-site consumption yet. Um, and those will be coming down the pipe too. That being said, I mean, I was fast and furious. I'm, I actually talk fast generally, but again, the mission is clear. We're trying to get as many people on board into the mission and also prepared for how you're going to take your spot in the industry if you're interested in participating. I'm always down for a QA. And so that's what we're going to move to next. I know that there was already a question in the back, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Do me a favor, repeat the question. Yes, I will. All right. All right. You're first up because you had your hand up and then the guy behind it. No, you're first. You are first. Yeah. Um, I want to, to ask with the, the events, what type of um, activities happen at the lift off event? What type of activities happen at the lift off event? Well, um, a myriad of things. But we always kick it off with uh, city leaders who are coming to show their support. I think it's important to recognize when you don't see city leaders talking and talk out there, then trust me, they're not walking the walk somewhere else, right? And so I purposely bring them as a, a clue in to let you know that we actually have through the ranks a lot of support here. What we need are more community members are participating. We also have resource tables. So we usually at minimum have 20 to 30 other uh, organizations or entities like BMCC that will come and provide resources, show you how to get into the industry, get you um, set up with other people who are interested in um, partnership. It's meant to be for networking. Um, and then we have a panel discussion. The panel really will vary depending on the location. Lately, a lot of people want to know about the enforcement piece. So I bring the sheriff with me. And I think it's awesome that he is willing to sit on the panel with us because he is committed to making sure communities understand what he's trying to do. Um, and as we go forward, it does evolve. The parade and rally, we had a whole concert and there were also panel discussions and a lot of music and also consumption. We had legal consumption areas because we cannot technically consume in a park legally. So we actually, for the first time, set up tents in the street where we also had locked off and there is a legal place. Wherever you can smoke a cigarette, you can smoke weed. 
And where you're not supposed to smoke a cigarette, you're not supposed to smoke weed there either. And so it's very easy in New York, unlike other places where public consumption is actually not allowed as part of the shaming that still happens. And so we're nipping that in the bud, pun intended. And, and honestly, um, you know, I think it's a good thing for us to more normalize what consumption really looks like. Also, don't assume what's in someone's pipe. Uh, hemp flour has no THC, relatively no THC, um, and high CBD, and it looks and smells very much like regular weed, because it is. And so oftentimes the assumption is what people also have to get past. So those are a couple of things that we're doing as far as events, but we're open. The Juneteenth uh, block party is just that. It's a block party. And so we, we want to be wherever the communities are. We're also looking at Summer Jam, which is technically out of New York City jurisdiction, but so many people are going to be attending. They're having um, the possibility of cannabis be a small part, and we want to make sure we're there. So we're just where people are period. And then whatever they're doing there, we're trying to amplify it, take it to the next level, um, ensure that it's legal as well, and give off alternatives if it's not. In the back. What is the wait time for getting a license? So the long answer is that it can be indefinite. It depends on the state, right? In our situation, it actually has not been more than a year because the application for the you know, hundreds of licenses that I said already have been given out. Those came all last year. And so they've already been uh, approved for it and a lot of people open. What we're waiting on right now are the regulations to be published and final. And the regulations are like the rules of the road. Right now, we only have conditional and the conditional licenses are all closed. They were meant to be a skeleton, if you will. If you're building a human body, the conditional license track represents the skeleton of it, but we still haven't made the heart, the stomach, the lungs, the brain, the like real organs that really make the body move. We haven't made that yet. So we expect those licenses to be open for application starting in this fall after Labor Day. That's like a fingers crossed. Government is hella slow. Like it is the slowest thing ever. For me, especially as someone who comes from private sector, that's one of the biggest challenges I have is like really constantly pushing the speed. Government likes to get pat on the back for making a decision, but then it takes 10 years for the decision to actually make the impact for the community. So we're hoping to avoid some of that in this round. I hope I answered your question, but the, right now I would say in New York, it, it's a less than a year from the time the application is to when they're finally issuing it. Question here? Sadly, I have to look at my children, but I did want to ask, where can I get that sweater? That oh, hey, Jen, we are legit trapped around here. Yeah. No, I, I, I want to represent fully. This is actually made by a Black woman who was one of the only Black women to get a license in Portland, Oregon. Um, and you can get it from legittrapping.bigpartel.com. And she has a whole legit trapping set up. And the Foot Life Ambassador, is that... Would I, because I'm interested in that, would I go to that website? That website will allow everyone to pass along this uh, presentation. It'll allow you to sign up for our uh, email list, but you can also send me an email at cannabis at sbs.nyc.gov, that right here. Yep. And that email basically is manned by our whole team, which isn't a lot. But if you uh, A, want a meeting, Jason's going to be the person to make sure that we actually get it on the calendar. But B, the number one thing you can say is, hey, I want to be, uh, you know, considered for ambassador. Please make sure I get the information for a sign up when it comes available. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And I love your presentation. Thank you. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming, though. Yes. I was like, I'm still and happy to be Mother's Day. <laughs> Um, question. Um, I'm not a smoking fan, but I do respect others that do smoke. I get it, you know, that's they that's they thing. But like as far as concerts and stuff, like how you mentioned summer jam, you know, like amplified theater and some sort, you know, it's I feel it's kind of disrespectful for people to just pull out and just blow smoke in other people's face. So I was wondering, maybe can that like be, you know, improvised to where it could be a section, a seating section for people that smoke, you know what I'm saying? And and that, I see that hasn't happened yet. So, 
you know, I'm just not this is the first time I'm putting it out here <laughs> because it happens so much, you know, you know, people that don't smoke, we we get the, you know, the ends of to where we're in discomfort on trying to enjoy the show. I understand so. completely. What I will reiterate that wherever you're not allowed to smoke cigarettes, you're legally not allowed to smoke weed. And so um the fact of the matter is that in general, that's usually the vaping law is all inclusive there, that those three are all being disrespected in most places that are outdoors or amphitheater. Um, and so I can't solve for everything. I just feel though, one of the things I always push back on is weed always gets the short end of the stick because you smell it distinctly. Whereas, I'm sorry, to me, a cigarette smoke smells worse than that, but that's where we have the challenge. What I'd like to do is for events similar to what we did with Union Square Park is to set up what we call our lift up, legal lift up tent, where they are in a place that, yes, you make a choice. I'm going over there. I will also just reiterate that consumption is all is not only through the smoking methodology. Um, I am a big proponent of understanding all the different ways to consume cannabis to make sure that um, everybody gets the benefit. And to your point, not every place is a smoking place. Right, but you still need cannabinoids. Um, I'm not busting out my vape or my uh, pipe in the airport, but I still need cannabinoids. So there are other things, patches, sublingual strips, and sprays, as well as edibles and uh, tinctures. So I agree with you. It should be a, a respect thing, period. And I think that's something you've got to work on in general. Like I, I almost got burned with a cigarette on out. When walking here, because of the way I walk, I walk right now from Brooklyn, I'm getting in and out, and somebody was waving it around, and that, you know, that's just part of the, the challenge, but I, I agree, I think we have to be um, communities that are consuming responsibly and respectfully. So I have a question from uh, our Zoom group, and it says, uh, so I can't grow at home unless I'm part of a medical program, so that's the question. Right now, no, legally you cannot. Um, now, we do have in the law that a year from the opening of the adult use market, so technically the adult use market opened at December 29 of 2022 when the first store opened, we're supposed to be having adult use home grow. Um, what I will say is so far, uh, love the state and my partner, but they haven't necessarily met all these deadlines. Not to their full fault, um, we had a former governor that waited six months and we didn't have a person in his role for, so they've been catching up pretty fast, but so I won't quote December 2023 as when home grow will be available, but somewhere in the vicinity of the three to six months in that time period, they still have to put out regulations on it. I use the point airport because ain't nobody coming in people's houses for real, for real to like check and regulate like that, but it is the case that by law, it's a year from the opening. So eventually, adults will be able to home grow. And we'll be training them from our office as well on how to do that safely and in compliance. Um, Tashita, this, is, uh, this has been fantastic. I know that you have a tight schedule. And I just wanted to, first off, say thank you so much for coming out and seeing us. Uh, and for all the information that you're giving us. And we still have more information coming from actual BMCC continuing education. I'm excited to have folks in the house here locally too. Yeah. So a uh, big round of applause. For this. Yeah. Uh, and we'll be in touch. This is just first step in the, or should I say several steps in the journey. It, is. Okay. Yeah. it has been a pleasure. If you didn't already get a uh, pin and or a little prime card, we'll make sure you get one on your way out. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Yeah, definitely. And she will just uh, that's Excellent. So uh, it is now another bit of pleasure that I have, and I'll leave this up here for a few more minutes if you guys haven't taken pictures of it. Uh, contact information for Nashita, who is um, has been such a wonderful partner of so much knowledge at once. I mean, I hope you took pictures of all the slides because there was so much information on each of those slides that could really help you as I'm creating a business. Um, so next up, uh, feel free to grab a little bit of food, but we're actually going to uh, continue our conversation with continuing education. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, one of the champions.
for this. Uh, Lloyd Jarvis will be uh, speaking to us about the BMCC specific training available that you can start taking in the fall. So thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I'll give you guys two minutes. Thank you. 
Online. Right, still a little loud here. All right, we're good. So is, is this a class or a student? It's a student. What's the name of the student? This is not So good day to the BMCC Business and Entrepreneurial Club. My name is Floyd Jarvis. My name is Floyd Jarvis. I am the new program director at Continuing Education BMCC at 25 Broadway for the Cannabis Workforce Development Program. So it's in partnership with the main campus here. Eventually, we'll be coming over to the main campus. So it's a three-year, full disclosure, three-year grant funding program. We received the grant from the state, from the governor, a $2 million grant in conjunction with Lehman College. So what Lehman College is going to be doing, Lehman College is going to be working with yeah, some of the Lehman College is going to be working with the card applicants that Yashida mentioned. The card applicant stands for conditional CAGR, conditional adult use recreational dispensary license. So Lehman is going to be working with the card applicants, rolling out their business and rolling out their business plan. What we're going to be doing over at 25 Broadway. About six to seven minute walk from here. I was walking at the Institute of uh, Education. We're going to be doing workforce development training. Pick up your flyer, and if there are some color copies, they all show with the black and white card on your eyes. So, we're going to be doing our uh, third thing. We're going to start. So, the first thing we're going to start with is the Pacific Training Program, and it's going to be a three track training program from the Canada Security. Cannabis manufacturing technician, and they'll teach you how to be a cannabis dispensary. Dispensary is so key. Now, everything is going to be in compliance with the OCM. The OCM stands for anybody. What does OCM stand for? Official cannabis Both. Office of Cannabis Management. So, thank you. Thank you. So OCM is the New York State Office of Cannabis Management. Like how you need a liquor license for the SLA, the State Liquor Authority. The brand new office in the state is called NYS OCM. Google, Bing, Yahoo, NYS OCM, New York State Cannabis Management. Well, the cannabis management will come up. Now, when we train you to do cannabis security, cannabis manufacturing technician, or cannabis dispensary, so will be in compliance. Our rule uh, culture rules with the OCM. So that's what we that's what we need. Yes, it's the lovely OCM website, which I spent like the past year and a half just like looking at everything. Learn everything. But anyway, so yes, so that is the program that we are doing by year three. So right now, these are just certificate programs. 
the, the free certificate program they begin on the fall. So I advise you uh get your phone on on the uh scan it in the ticket on the dinosaur and and um sign up yes there it is qr code and and sign up to be on our waivers then in the fall which is what spring spring late august early september my team and i will be going to help call the interview one second i see who to call the interview to see on our week, uh, close and close up. So, first, first cohort would be like 340. So, if you haven't, uh, if you are focused on the wait list, uh, you can do that now. And, uh, what else? So, the, the, the first the first year it will be a three credit rare program. Later on, we're going to be developing uh, classes that you have to pay for. But right now, so, so let's say you sign up to be a cannabis dispensary associate. You have your bad cat. Great. So, great question. First, the first one I'm coming out with is uh, security, then manufacturing, then dispensary associate. So, let's say you yeah, the dispensary associate. Uh, certification can now go to any one of the legal adult use dispensaries or any one of the legal medical facilities dispensaries and apply for a job. And you'll be more compliant than maybe the person they have working or someone else that's in the job. So, this is what's I can see again. So, this is first and then in the back. So, this program is unique, it's important. It's here at UCC, not at the main college at one time, I got a thing, but down at 25 Broadway, right next to the um, the boat, where the boat is where it was. Any questions? First question, second question, that I don't even keep up with you, but the way you have been doing that, and the way you did, the same way you did that, that signed up, and they said that they were all supposed to call that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm already yeah. Okay, and then one point. Yeah, and then the other part is the all being like you already have medical all specialties in recreation systems over there. Are they for you? Are they already in compliance, or they will have to be compliant with all that? I see you talk about that. The, the, the regulations came out. I don't know if she was not the regulations came out. Made a high school. Oh, so remember she said uh, the OCM made the skeleton, but they didn't make the heart yet. They didn't make the liver yet. This, that, and the third. So I'm not going to say that I'm compliance, but we'll train everyone to be in full in compliance. Yeah, man. Good to Freeze at the company. God, I saw um, I actually applied for the uh, car, the car, the car out there. Okay, so I, I go to all these events. So, 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 but only eight are open. So I know, like, you know, within two years, they'll probably be more open. But would I be able to take this training? Let me ask you one when the OCM gave you the license. Did, so, did they say that you couldn't sign up for work with the development program? So I haven't, I haven't, I'm still, hopefully, I'll get announced this June. I haven't got an issue with the dispensary license. Oh, your application is still a good standard. I spoke Oh, your applicant, but I'm getting a license. I'm not a license. Yeah, okay, I got it. it. Yeah, yes, you can. And even if you're still a license, that would be two questions. Yeah. Regardless, Mr. Chris Alexander signed for this. Okay, all right. <laughs> what up, what up? I'm saying he's the executive director of the OCM. Okay. There's no barriers to you signing up for work for the development program. And actually, it would be good for you because since you're going to be a dispensary owner, it'll be good to know how the employees, your, your security employees, your dispensary social employees, and or your manufacturing employees right, are right. trained. So, yeah, good question. All right, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. No, anybody, anybody, anybody. 
I'm I'm just here because I knew this was happening today. And I didn't get sent down to the program. I started last month at eight. So I said, now let me get down here and get one minute before inside the campus. But the guy's about to program. Um, what's the age of the starting? 18. Oh, 18 foot. Yeah, yeah. Because my son had been. Yeah. Did it start before you? No, we did it. We did it. So, when did she was saying, uh, working with government agencies as well as working with uh, academic institutions? We got to sign off. So, we could be ready to go. Sing for the presidents and the Get us there. The, the minor in Canada. So this this is not yet attached to the academic side. Right now, this is a certificate course, three separate certificate courses. You get online badges, and it's online. You have you only come in twice, the two times that you would come in for each. Of course, you'll be going to a row house. You'll be, going, you'll be going to the job site to see what the work is going to have. So you can, in theory, transfer graduate and still do one or all three of these programs. But, but by year three, please be able to see it's my job, my team, because my senior has to create an associate's degree specifically for candidates. So it's about three months. Is there any way you have to put out free pass for me to take this to the certification? You got to be 18. Okay, and, and sign up to the waitlist. Those are the questions. I also wanted to thank you for the time. Um, uh, I still have a little bit of 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 a any other questions yes sir Hey, hey. Okay. It starts in the fall, in late August, early September. If, like, we wanted to work in the cannabis industry at all, would you recommend this type of training? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you want to work, if you want to work in the New York State yeah. cannabis industry and keep your job, your employment. It's highly recommended because we are compliant with OCM standards as they yeah. 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 So, so, so the next week, I'm going to answer the person. I'm going to try to answer three people. Ask, what are the benefits of cannabis? There are a host of benefits. Uh, the stress reliever. There, there are many, many medical, medical conditions that can treat. And it's also a plant used in different conditions uh, for certain drugs. So those are just some of the benefits. And I forgot the second question we had. Nerd. Oh, well, to be honest, yeah, it's a great thing. 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 It's a great th
So, so people think that cannabis became the lead song. Uh, we want to start. There's a whole history side. I know. It's like, which side of the history do you want to start like, with? Do I, do I, yeah. But, but okay, not like the focus. I was studying the first of the problem. This question why cannabis became legal. So many people think cannabis became illegal in the United States when uh, on the, the town of health revolution in the late 60s and late 70s, people started uh, experimenting with a lot of drugs. But when you really, really go back and check the United States history, cannabis became illegal internationally during the during colonialism, during the international slave trade. Uh, Indians as well as Africans were using cannabis uh, as laborers. They used it uh, spiritually. Cannabis, cannabis, if you if you there's a study done in uh Jamaica Barbados and Belize. It was called Ganja in Jamaica. They wanted during the counterculture revolution, they wanted to find out uh if the theory of AIDS. Of a uh, what, what, what's the thing that is in the the amazing something a motivational syndrome? They wanted to think about a motivational syndrome, so they needed three populations where persons use cannabis on a regular. So they went to Jamaica on a farm where they cut and cane. They went to Belize and you know, on a sugar plantation. They went to Barbados and Fisher Village, where all these men that were doing this hard labor. They smoked a whole lot of weed, and they found that if you smoked, they found that when you smoked uh, a joint, as opposed to not smoking a joint, you apparently kind of cut more pain. So you could do a lot more hard and vigorous labor <laughs> with cannabis, with a uh, stress reliever. I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but during those times was when cannabis was illegal, like it became illegal. You could check it out during our international treaty. This is like late 1800s, not even in the 1960s. So this was pre uh pre alcohol prohibition cannabis has been illegal. And it has been illegal because it, it, it has been associated with non-white culture in India and Africa as something that common kind of people do that common kind of people do. It's not an aristocratic uh I think it's not wine or champagne. It's literally from the birth and you grow it. And you do all ages do it or you just don't well, all uh, it, uh, adults, it should be left to adults to do it. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? That was a good question. Any other questions? That's a good answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So, yeah, sign up if you haven't. Like this gentleman, he's been signed up. So, you uh, walk over right here. So we have to hire the case manager, the case manager is going to be hired like the passing Once that person hires, and they are asked to talk to the case manager. That'll be the first thing that they do. So like second week of June, oh, yeah, you know, we look out for it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for having me. All right. So we'll have our lunch for five minutes. In just five minutes, guys, you guys will be able to get back to finish up with these food, crowd each other. But I just wanted to take a moment to celebrate what you've been doing this semester and really to say. Uh, being a BMCC is really special because we try really hard to make sure that we're listening and happy to you as faculty and trying to give you the things that you want to accomplish in your life uh, and help you along that way. Um, and we couldn't do it without student leaders stepping up and being real advocates and supporters for who, for this charge, for this mission. And so I wanted to just invite Ilana up. So I'm 
And I really wanted to thank you for all of you who have turned out here. Um, my major is small business entrepreneurship. I was introduced to Professor Snipes a year and a half ago, and he's been really a wonderful mentor to me. Um, and everyone who's come into his orbit has really improved in so many ways. I just want to say thank you, Ilana, for all that you have done this semester. We really appreciate you. And I just wanted to please give a huge round of applause. <laughs> Uh, the, actually, the student government sent this one over because um, I did mine first, and so they wanted to follow up with one too. Um, <laughs> and what it is, is once leaders start stepping up, like Carmen has stepped up in so many different ways, you know, she's going, you could go to either NYU or Columbia, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing that, in so they could uh, move forward in that way. But people come from all different backgrounds, and the opportunities are here. And I would just say, Alana, do you have a few words you'd like to offer up for the next set of leaders coming? <laughs> My father is in the Living Songs Ontario. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so guys, it's probably really special because it's run by you. Like you were the advocates, you're the champion, you submit their paperwork, you get things done. You guys plan the events, all of that. And so we're preparing for next fall. We actually have an opportunity and opening for the four um, positions as club officers. And I want to know, uh, is anyone in here already decided that they want to be a club officer? And if they have, I would just like you to just raise your hand and tell me, say, hey, I'm interested in this one, or I'm interested in that one. Yes. I'm going to be all um, Vice President of <laughs> Yes, you'll be able to work virtually. You'll be able to work virtually. Yeah. We'll have we'll always have IRL uh, events because it's really important for students to have a place to come to uh, and to meet with each other. So every Wednesday we'll always be in person uh, downstairs in, the, in our new favorite room. So if not, uh, I'll make sure that we stick to the same room. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so who else wants to be an officer? No, yes. I mean, <laughs> yes, go ahead. Oh, you have something to say. Yeah, um, I really want people to get involved in clubs. There's a $4,000 budget every semester for clubs that you can um, do whatever you want to the club. And if that is not enough, you can always go back and ask people. I've really worked hard to make sure that there is a full sponsorship. So that if club, there's like if you run out of money, you can say we need more money for events. But I take advantage of it. I've said to you every single bit of the money yeah. today. I was in meeting. I was like, okay, we allocated twenty thousand dollars just for stuff. I mentioned that the business entrepreneurship magazine that is funded for the for the fall because I'm not going to be here. Like we need to have money set set for the side for these events. Um, if you're not going to be in a club, join the student government. Let your voices be heard. Please do not sit by the sideline. You have a lot of influences and you can make things happen. Get involved in the clubs, ask for money, do things. It doesn't have to be on campus. It doesn't even have to be business related. As long as it's getting people together, getting engagement, we need to do that. So um, that is, I'm getting off my mind. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm a, I'm a visitor here, I'm club hopping, but I, I'm pleased to be here, thank you for the invite, and um, my name is Moni Thomas, I have been nominated for the disciplinary committee for BFCC, 
selected as a model Senate in my school in Albany. I did a whole project in Albany on the Equal Rights Amendments. Uh, you know, my experience of what I really went through in reality as according to the ERA, you know, so we got to go out and vote. You know, for the new year to come and make sure we turn the ballot over and check yes, okay, for the EPRA, okay? So uh, it's a very pleased to meet everyone. I am a people person, friendly. I love everyone and just enjoy the rest of your, you know, your spring and your summer walk, okay? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I was in Jordan and came out for Yes. I like your other Yes. 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 Hi everyone, my name is Eric, and I am interested to be, to be the president. <laughs> If there, <laughs> do I? Yes. Are you are you coming back as as president? You want to? We're gonna have to get some ballots together. Are you guys ready to do a ballot uh, for this? So, Ilana, let us know what you want to do in your next. Here. So, I think that's a minority. It's <laughs> someone who wants to elevate, innovate. Wow. <laughs> So we're gonna have to have um, whoever would like to be part of the club next year, um, I'd love for you to vote. Anyone else, you're welcome to vote because you can become part of the club today. Um, but I'd really like it to be a thing, especially to the people. I don't 
And we're finding it. And what I want you guys to do now that we have everyone's attention up here is I want you to go by. Say your name and say the position that you're interested in holding. We heard some things shift during this meeting. So I just want to capture the position you're holding. Say your name. And everyone mark down. You can write down each person's name if you'd like, right? Because we're not voting for president anymore. Right? We're not voting for president anymore. Um, uh, Eric has moved his vote away from president to vice president. So I'm going to say, Everyone, keep your ballots. You can mark stuff off. And first, Eric, what position? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric. And I want to move my position to vice president since I want to learn first from the previous president. I want to work with her as a vice president. Yeah, please vote me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Welcome in. 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 Uh, the way that you know, we talked about the brain already is it's the committee of the um, yeah, it's not. Yeah. 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 Right now, everyone, everyone who's voting, pay close attention right this second. So far, there is no race between president, secretary, or treasurer, right? No race between us. You do not have to write them down. The ones that you have to write down are for vice president. Right? So, angel and Eric. Angel or angel and turn. <laughs> so, give us your votes. Get those ballots in. Um, if you voted for something else, mark it out and put us put that in for those two, and uh, we'll count your ballots and you'll know who your officers are. I'll start working with you guys this week because we have a budget. Yeah. So we'll be able to put our budget in, have everything ready for live, literally in the second week of last. Yeah. So that's how quickly we we'll move this time. Thanks to Carlene. And Kate for all of their like advocating on the back end and pushing so much. So I appreciate both of you guys. Okay, everyone vote. Should they say okay? okay. Pull your put your votes to the end of the table. Take your books to the end of the table. You got my number, man. Thank <laughs> you.
So what I have is sort of gauges like Thank you. 
Thank you. Oh.